All right, have you ever sat down to edit some of your landscape raw files and you look at it and you've just got absolutely no idea where to start? Or maybe you start and then later on when you see the result, it's embarrassing. You've completely destroyed the file. Well, don't worry, you're not alone. This is a very common thing. So in the video today, I wanna to give you some solid advice for overcoming this problem, especially when it comes to dynamic light and sunrises and sunsets. Often it's coming down to one particular thing in general. That's what we're going to look at now. I'm going to pull up a raw file and show you step by step how you can overcome this problem and get solid results. Results that give you depth and three dimensionality as well as a realistic look. All right, let's have a look. All right, here's a raw file that I want to work on and let's just face it straight up, this does not look that good, does it? This does not look like it's going to be a photo worth keeping, but I'm telling you now, one, being there in person, it was some beautiful light. The wave action was awesome. I quite like the composition. And for this particular location, it's quite a unique perspective as well. I'm confident that in this file, there is something here that can really come out quite nice and potentially be worth keeping and putting into the portfolio. But looking at this, it certainly doesn't reflect what I felt out there and what I was seeing and obviously what I wanna to show to the viewer. This is the common scenario that we all face as photographers, right? Having these flat raw files because we have these big dynamic range scenes. We've got a lot of bright tones, which is essentially what I've exposed for. Look at the histogram. See, I've just stopped the exposure from blowing out those highlights. But then looking at the histogram, all those dark tones down here, they're just way too dark. We can't see any detail. And that's perfectly normal. This is fine and this is a very common scenario to face, but herein lies the problem. Us as photographers do not often understand the concept of tonal range or what can sometimes be called value. And essentially what I'm getting at is what's known as the atmospheric perspective. And the atmospheric perspective is something used in art to make something look three-dimensional as opposed to 2D. And this perspective really leans into the fact that in nature, and let's look on this top left-hand side, anything further away has way less contrast, way less tonal value. So you can see that the mountain, the hills in the back here, they're not black anymore. They're completely washed out. So we have way less contrast, we have way less detail, and essentially it's not as sharp as well. We're seeing that slightly on the cliff here. You have these darker tones in the front, and then look in the distance. You can see that there's a, a graduation as things get lighter and lighter. The problem with raw files and photography is that we open up the file here in your editing software, and if you just start going crazy on some of the adjustments, like contrast, for example, all these global adjustments which work on everything at once, you can very easily destroy the atmospheric perspective. Now, in theory, that atmospheric perspective should be there because we're a photographer, we're capturing what nature does but we can destroy that right here, especially if you might grab the dehaze slider and go to the right on that. Look what that's doing in that far background with those darker tones. So before we get in and start processing this file, and I'll show you how to create that depth and separation, let me show you an example now of some fabulous artworks by my mate, Wayne Vickers. So Wayne's a buddy of mine and he's really a world-class artist and his medium is his oil painting on canvas and he has some two spectacular paintings that we're just gonna quickly look at now. So keep in mind these paintings, they're obviously done under two-dimensional surface, but why is it when we look at these, I feel like there's depth. I can tell that this valley sweeps and rolls on into a background. This mountain to my eye looks further away than this mountain and then this ridge and foreground all look closer again. There's a very clear sense of depth and three-dimensionality and we have the exact same thing here. Why are these stones appearing to us closer than the mountains back here? There are a few things, obviously there's multiple things that do this, but in regards to the lesson today, the atmospheric perspective, let's just take a look. Where is the darkest of darks in Wayne's painting here? It's whatever's closest to the viewer, right? So in the immediate foreground in those shadows, we have some really dark darks. And then you'll see that progressively as we fade on to the distance, is there such thing as black by the time we get to that distance in that far mountain? There's not. So there's a graduation, a fading out of the darkest of darks. You'll see the exact same thing going on in this image. These shadows closest to the viewer have very dark tones in them. And then as we progress into the background, we're seeing that 
black no longer exists and we're just completely fading out. The details are heavily reduced compared to the foreground. The tonal range is much shorter, so we, we don't really have those deep, dark tones back there. And even the saturation, there's less saturation in that distance compared to the foreground. So how does that apply to our photography? We need to keep this in mind when, our, when we're post-processing. We can very easily, again, with global adjustments, add too much contrast back there, too much detail, too much saturation, and now you have a photo that just looks bad, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Um, so let's go back to our raw file and then keep this concept on, in mind and let's see if we can finally show the details and create some depth and separation in a raw file that just looks so flat. All right, the first thing I'm going to do is approach the dynamic range and just balance out the tones. Firstly, globally, I'm going to bring up the exposure just because it is quite dark in general, but except for the sky. So as I do the global exposure here, let's say about a stop, that's been good for the water, the rock, but obviously the sky has been way overexposed. I'm going to bring the highlights down partially to try and correct that, but I need to keep in mind that when I do a global highlight recovery, I'm also removing those highlights off the rocks and the water, which is not ideal. So we're going to bring that down minus 25. The, the other thing I'm going to do straight away is change the color profile to landscape. This also does affect the shadows. You'll see here as we go back and forward, look at the histogram. We have dark shadows. The profile subtly helps that. That's fine and it also gives the colors a bit more punch. Let's get straight into creating our depth and separation and really leading the eye back here to the main subject matter and showcasing some depth through the frame. Firstly, I'm gonna push K for an adjustment brush if you haven't seen this already, check out some of my other videos. This is the main and only tool I use. If you click the masking button, it's the brush, okay? And I use the feather flow and density at 100, so it's a very soft brush on the edges. But when I click, it will do 100% of my adjustment. And the way I like to use it is to make the adjustment first, apply the brush, and then adjust accordingly. So I'm gonna bring the exposure and highlights down and simply click and apply this up in the sky initially. Now, already I'm keeping the atmospheric perspective in mind. See with the brush, I'm not going too low to the horizon because let's remember the cloud up the top here is closest to the viewer compared to the cloud that we have down by the horizon. So we need to keep in mind anything far away shouldn't be too dark. The contrast should be significantly less. And when we talk about contrast, I'm more referring to the range from the darks and lights. So it's a lot more faded essentially like a mid-tone. I'm gonna push K now and this will give me a fresh brush and this time I'm actually going to increase the dehaze and I'm only doing this on that top part of the sky and this is essentially going to replicate what we saw in Wayne's paintings in the foreground where there was a higher contrast. So the dehaze, if you look at the histogram, it's, it's creating more contrast in the midtones essentially. So I'm doing that up there and on the same brush, I might just bring down the exposure a little bit more. I'm darkening that whole top section there in the hopes of pushing the eye towards the center zone. I'm gonna do a similar thing in the immediate foreground. I'm gonna go higher detail. I'm gonna bring up some whites and highlights. I'm going to increase the texture. This is closest to the viewer. So it should have some details which are just highly evident compared to anything that's further away. We're creating the illusion of depth here, three dimensionality. It's close, we should really see those details in there. So I've increased the texture, I might increase the whites a bit more and I may even warm that up slightly just so it's mimicking what's going on in the sky. Just a small amount there, like so. Before I go further, I'm just gonna quickly jump into the color panel and increase the vibrance and saturation because again, that raw is obviously so flat about here. And the last thing I'll do in regards to color is jump in the grading and just warm the highlights up. This is giving us not only tonal separation now, we're getting color separation. I'm going to warm the highlights and cool the mids. The mids are going to hit that water. So you can see as I bring that down and I'm holding shift to cr create that fixed point so I don't slip onto a different color. We've now got color contrast, warm hues, cool hues, color separation, complementing our 
tonal separation, which we're really going to hit now. I'm going to push K for a new brush. Let's create that depth in the background. I'm going to raise the shadows and the blacks. And I'm going to start to think of zones. I've got an immediate foreground here, midground out in the water, and then essentially the background with all these cliffs. I want to make sure that background has that less tonal range. As I'm running this brush along, I'm going all the way, I'm hitting the sky, that's completely fine because it's all off in the distance. I'm running that across like so. Let's just turn that on and off. All right, so you see what we're doing there? Keep in mind what we looked at with Wayne's paintings. You'll see this in any great artist's work, all right? Now I'm gonna do a, a separate one. I'm gonna push K and in the water, I'm gonna just raise the shadows and blacks and I'm more worried now about these rocks back here in the distance. We're just gonna go in and a similar thing on these guys just making sure that they're lifted and not as deep and dark as the rocks in front here. So start to think of separation in all your zones stretching from closest to the viewer to further away. And you're going in and just selectively raising those tones accordingly, raising the shadows and blacks. Another thing I'll sometimes do is rehaze. So not dehaze, rehaze. I'll show you how that works. Let's do this now on whatever is far off in the distance, mimicking what's happening on that far left hand corner. I'm going to go down, instead of dehazing, we rehaze, we go left. Let's go about 15, it could be a bit heavy, but we'll see. And I'm just gonna click on this side now, the furthest distance away. And that's gonna help us separate the front cliff from these back cliffs. And I'll just adjust that accordingly so you can see what's happening there. So when we zoom out now, it's all gonna start to take effect. I might even do one more rehaze, not as heavy, just for this entire background part here at the base of this cliff. Run that through, and then you can see where I've applied that. As we move into the front ground, I'm just gonna create some more, oh, the front ground, the foreground, I'm gonna create a bit more tonal separation whites and very, very gently the shadows coming up. Remember the shadows, the black should really be the darkest of darks down here, closest to the viewer. So I don't wanna go too bright on them. If we go too bright here, that's how you lose the depth, okay? Whether the whole shot is too dark or it's too bright like that, you're just losing it all. So I, you gotta have dark foregrounds, darker when it comes to those blacks. So we'll, we'll raise them up a little bit but not too much. We'll just See, I'm doing it more halfway up the foreground, not down here right at the front. The last thing I'll say now is um, back on these cliffs, remember we, we've lifted the darker tones, but we still want some kind of separation. We've kind of got some nice, interesting stuff here with these greens, even in the rock itself. See, there are different tones in there. We want tonal separation still to be going on there. So a way that I would do that is using a brush, I'll bring up potentially the whites and highlights because there's minimal whites and highlights there, but there is some. So when I hit the wall, especially on these greens up here, it's gonna lift the tones that have a gentle amount of light on them. But all those dark tones that we've already worked on, they should remain relatively dark. So we're not gonna have to worry about making those look a bit too bit too washed out and bright. We've already done that to some degree. Now, see how I use the brush there? I intended to start on the cliff and, the cliff and then I just progress through the frame. That's why I always put something on the brush first and then I start painting and I just observe. And if I like where it's going, I just keep going with it. One tip, don't hold down and do a lot of brush work for a minute straight because if you make a mistake and you need to undo, um, you're gonna be undoing everything. So do multiple clicks. So if you have to undo, it's only going back a certain distance. The last thing will just be some of these dark shadows up here on the top of the cliff. You just bring these guys out using a small brush now. And that's potentially too much, but you get the idea anyway. And these ones over here have to be lighter because they're further off. So I've continued running that along there. All right, is this image done? Certainly not, but let's just do a before and after. That's what we started off with. That's where it's going. And if we turn off all our local adjustments, all the brushwork, you can see how important making those local adjustments are. 
Keep it in mind, the atmospheric perspective, when you go to approach a raw file, especially something that's heavily backlit like this, make sure that your, all your dark tones, it progresses from the foreground through to the background, beginning with a higher contrast, a greater tonal range, darker darks, brighter brights. As we get off into that distance, it all gets compressed in more like a mid-tone. There's no more dark tones back there. And that way clearly we'll get that separation in a, a sense of three dimensionality in depth. Um, like I said, not saying this image is done, but for the sake of the lesson, I hope that you've got something out of that. Keep it in mind, especially if you don't know how to start off on your raw files, let's see all the details. And then from there, use your local adjustments, use that brush and start to break it down. And then don't forget you can do that with the color as well. And if you like this teaching style, and you wanna delve in a lot deeper and follow along with the raw files, just check out the link below. I've got a course on this where I really break it down. And there's a few other factors, quite a few that we didn't go into today, but I hope this really helps you anyway. Thanks for viewing the channel and I'll see you in the next video.